Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the NBA front office show. We have made it through Christmas. All the, the friends, family, presents, all that kind of stuff. I'm actually a little bit sad. And now I'm going to start counting down till Christmas next year. But now we head towards New Year's. And we've got plenty of NBA to talk about. I'm Trevor Lane. You can find me over on X at Trevor underscore Lane on Instagram and threads at Trevor Lane NBA. Joined by Keith Smith, smart enough to make himself just at Keith Smith NBA everywhere. Uh, Keith, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. It's uh, hey, it's been good. It's uh, I feel like just starting sort of to creep back into normal routine. I think I've said it before, but I am a creature of habit, so I rely on my routine. And when my routine is a little bit thrown off, I'm a little bit thrown off. But but we're getting back to normal now. So we've got we've got a ton to get into today. <laughs> yeah, so I. I I'm I'm looking at this thinking I want to talk a little bit about Christmas and and how everything went and all all of that, but uh, but we've got a lot to get into. Maybe we'll save the Christmas talk for for tomorrow because let's just let's dive in. Because I'm looking at this list, we've got yeah, so we've got much a, to talk quite about. a lengthy show, and uh, people are busy this time of year. Let's not make them do a one hour show. All right, let's go. Let's get to this. Uh, the Suns blistering comments uh, from the Phoenix Suns. Sounds like Kevin Durant, Eric Gordon, other like. The Suns have not been performing up to expectations and players are starting to get unhappy. This is the time of year when it happens, right? In October, optimism reigns, right? Everybody is excited because everybody has the same record and everybody made the best moves over the summer and everybody's enthusiastic. You're back to school, essentially, right? You've got your your new school shoes and you're skipping off and and all that. (laughs) Now the reality of all the stuff you've got to do is starting to weigh on you, especially if you're not having success like like the Suns are dealing with. Um, this is the time of year this kind of stuff comes out. Is this a bigger concern? Because I, there's not a lot of flexibility here for, for Phoenix. So what do they do with an unhappy Kevin Durant or an unhappy Eric Gordon or whoever? Yeah, one, and one of those <laughs> players being unhappy is far more He's, consequential yeah. than the other, of course. Um, sure. Yeah, and you know, Durant pushed back a little bit, I think, on somewhere on social media of like all these people talk about me being unhappy. Like, just ask me. Uh basically was was the 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 tone of his comments. But I think it's uh one of those things where sure it hasn't gone the way I think anybody really hoped it would in Phoenix. They're 14 and 15. They got popped on Christmas night uh by a you know, kind of a beat up Mavericks team. It was mostly yeah. the Luca show, and he took good care game, of them though. with What's that? It was a good game, though. Yeah, it was a good game, but you know, Luca was just absolutely dominant. He was yeah. by far and away the best player on the court. And it was also a weird game from Phoenix. Like KD seemed kind of passive and not super interested. Like I don't know, it's just a very odd game. Um, in that that sense. So so we're at a spot where I get it. Like maybe he isn't real happy. I don't think we're to the point where he's like, I may trade me. I want to be somewhere else or anything like that. And I don't think it's going to get to that point by any means, but just something to keep an eye on. The Eric Gordon comments were basically him coming out and saying, Hey, I need shots. Like I can't just be running up and down the floor. And mm-hmm. he got beat up a little bit for it on social media. Cause people were like, uh, dude, you're Eric Gordon. Like, what are you talking about? You need more of a role. But I think it was, I think kind of the basis of his comments were like, if I'm not out there getting shots. What am I out there for? Like, he's right. not somebody who's going to be, you know, defending the other team's best player, or, you know, piling up 10 assists or 10 rebounds. Like he's out there to shoot and score. So clearly things just aren't, Going well in Phoenix. We're what one game and four and a half minutes of uh Booker Beal Durant all together in a game. So that's not been good either. So mm-hmm. things are just real messy. Yeah. And again, not a lot of flexibility for them to do something about it. They're gonna have to figure it out from within. Um unfortunately, yeah, they can't even get... trade picks to like get out of it either. Yeah. Like <laughs> that's the other they thing. They can't buy I mean, their way out. Yeah, they get themselves a little bit more flexibility by picking up some weird pick swap stuff going on, but yeah, there there's there's the to your point, yeah, very very little they can do to yeah. to uh, rectify this beyond play better and get healthy, I guess. Yeah. It's all they can they can hope to do right now. Yeah. Um Gabe Vincent out now 6 to 8 weeks. He can't, he basically missed the entire season. He played four games but was not effective in those four games and then uh, has been out dealing with his knee swelling has been a problem. And then he came back for one game, knee swelled right back up. So now he's having surgery. He'll be out six to eight weeks. 
Uh, fingers crossed. You never know how these things are going to go, obviously. And uh, Lakers fans are at the point where they are saying never again any player from the Miami Heat. <laughs> yeah, especially point guards, right? That maybe yes. uh, came in with a clean injury history, but then did not finish that way. So I can can see that where Laker fans are. It's it's one of those things where, you know, it's funny because I did obviously things get heated anytime the Celtics and Lakers play. Christmas was uh, no exception sure. um, with that. And a couple of people were like, who cares? The Lakers aren't even healthy. And it was Celtics fans were coming back a little with, uh, come on now, like Gabe Vincent, like that's not making a difference. And, you know, a lot of what happened there, but I think it's a little bit for the Lakers. It's almost like, how can you miss what you, what you never really had. But the bigger problem is that's how they use the non-taxpayer mid-level exception. Yes. So that's where it's not so much about Gabe Vincent being out for me, especially we're going to talk about the lineup change in a minute, um, which is should alleviate some of him not being there. But it is the bigger part is you could have used that on someone different, someone better, mm -hmm. someone who could have been more helpful. And now now you can't makes me wonder. I wouldn't normally you would be like, nah, you don't trade a guy in year one of a three year contract. I wouldn't be surprised if Gabe Vincent isn't moved at the trade deadline as part of something else. And I think from the Lakers side, it would be, hey, dude, we gave you 33 million guaranteed. Like that was good enough, you know, for we wish it worked out, but we're, we're trying to win the championship right now. Oh, 100%. He is the throw in in every single Lakers trade that I see proposed out there. Everybody is looking to move on from him. Um, and again, I, I've been stressing it's not his fault. He's not choosing sure. to get injured or anything like that because people get that frustration with the injury yeah. gets transferred over to the player. We saw with Kendrick Nunn, and that's not unique to Lakers fans. But um, but the challenge is how many teams are going to trade for a guy who is injured, right? I mean, this most likely keeps him out through the trade deadline. How many teams are going to trade for him with a knee injury with two more years under contract? That could get a little bit a little bit tricky, but sure. I mean, ten and a half million dollars under contract this season. If a team's willing to take that gamble, that's a pretty easy dollar amount to stack into another deal or or figure something out with. Yeah, I'm not. I by no means am I reporting anything here, but I just wrote a big piece about the Pistons for a spot track that posted today. We'll talk more about the Pistons a little bit later. But if you could do something like, and I'm not saying this is the right kind of deal. But sure. if you did like Gabe Vincent in a draft pick to get Alec Burks is, is a weird one because he hasn't played well this year. Like what if you did Gabe Vincent in a pick for Monte Morris, provided mm -hmm. he could get healthy and on the floor. That's kind of a it, where the Lakers, you're kind of paying the Pistons to eat the final two years of the deal. And the Pistons might look at it and say, all right, if Gabe Vincent gets healthy in a couple years, yeah, or in a year, we'll have yeah. him. He'll, he'll be out here and able to go for us, and and we're good. And, and that's still a fair value contract for Gabe Vincent, sure. provided he can play. So that's where I think that's the kind of move you have to make if he's not a, to your point, a throw-in salary in a much bigger trade where you're combining mm -hmm. him with like D'Angelo Russell or Rui Hachimura or both of them and, mm -hmm. and going to get something. That that would be the much bigger move uh, with that one. So let's talk about the lineup change. Where yeah. We're two games into this now uh super big lineup i know i texted you like the minute it came out and i was like who what the hell is this like the 90s are they're angry at this lack of space it's bizarre like, um yeah it's weird and i watched you and sean on christmas night uh talk about it post game and i know neither one of you are super huge fans either I, i'm not yeah. trying to put words in your mouth but yeah it's a little weird no, it's accurate. It's, um, yeah i don't like there's no one who can defend quick point guards. That was a problem for them from the, the jump in that lineup. LeBron can't do that anymore. It's not who he is. Uh, Torian Prince and Jared Vanderbilt did their best, but you know, they, you're, you're literally just bigger. You're, you're not faster. You're not quicker. You're, you're just bigger. And I don't know that that's the answer to anything that, um you know, hurts the Lakers right now. And in case anybody missed it, the main, Part of the lineup change was Jared Vanderbilt came in and D'Angelo Russell went to mm -hmm. the bench. And then you have your problem is Russell and Reeves come in kind of playing the same role off the bench at the same time. And that was odd to me, too. I, I just I, I didn't really get that one at all. It, it's in my mind, it's an overcorrection. I don't know if they're they're trying to zig where others are zagging. But last year, Darvin Ham was criticized for playing too many three guard lineups and fans hated it and, and all of this. Now this year, he's gone the other way and he's decided, fine, I'm not going to play any guards. <laughs> we're putting them, we're putting them all on the bench. Um, to me, it, I think it, it comes down to a few things. Um, defensively, that lineup—they've uh, played two games, so the stats 
they're yeah. kind of throwing up, right? But but over the long haul, I would imagine defensively they'll probably be okay because Reddish and Vando are pretty switchy, and you know you've got AD LeBron out there that's good size, so you should be good on the glass, and they have shown some improvement there. But you're asking LeBron to be your primary ball handler, and he's your only ball handler in that entire mix. Darvin Ham was already critical of Cam Reddish and Jared Vanderbilt for not being uh, aggressive enough attacking off the dribble. So you're asking them to do things that they're not really comfortable doing uh, uh, by necessity out of that lineup. And then of all the things to punt on in today's NBA, do you want that thing to be shooting? Yeah. Like that's because that's what you're doing with this lineup. Nobody's going to defend Jared Vanderbilt. Nobody's going to defend Cam Reddish. Torian Prince can shoot. LeBron can shoot from outside. Anthony Davis is more of a reluctant three-point shooter. So your spacing is going to be shot with this lineup when it seems like if, if look, D'Angelo Russell is slumping and you want to move him out, just swap in Austin Reeves and there you go, right? I mean, that's that. sometimes the little correction is what keeps you in your lane and keeps you on the road. The I'm going to jerk the wheel the other direction, that's what sends you into oncoming traffic. And if, to me, that's what the Lakers are doing right now. I hope I'm wrong, but... There's a reason why most teams in the NBA don't play this way. And I, I'm concerned that this is just going to lead to another change in a few weeks where they're going to go, oh, well, this didn't work. Okay, let's change things again. Yeah, I, I, I'm i with you too. I, I also didn't understand the comments that came out about Austin Reeves. He wants to limit him to 28 minutes per yeah. game. Like that doesn't, I don't know. Austin Reeves doesn't seem like the guy who really needs his minutes limited. I, I get it. You need to make sure he is protected uh, defensively for sure. Um, you know, they're the, the Celtics down the stretch of that game. They, they were already in control. But they really salted the game away just by going at Austin Reeves. And the Lakers were clearly had very little interest at that point in the game. I think they were, it was kind of going back and forth between like 10 and 15 point deficits. Yeah. They weren't trying to send help and double and really, you know, crisp rotations or anything. So they were no. just kind of leaving them on an island and they were just trading baskets out. So, yeah, I'm not going to judge the defensive component too much against Boston, who's one of the best offensive teams in the league. And quite frankly, against a lineup like that, it's just a horrible matchup uh, for the, the Lakers because they they don't play bigger. Yo, please. Yo, you should have taken Cam Reddish out and put Jackson Hayes in there for all the Celtics care, right? Just go bigger, bigger, bigger because we're playing five out anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, that's how they want to play. So so for them, that's a whole whole other thing. But yeah, it's just interesting. I, I don't know where this goes. I think obviously we all know it's going to lead to a trade eventually yeah. of something to rebalance a little bit. But yeah, you got to get some more ball handling and playmaking on the floor. And when you take one guy who can do that out and leave the other guy out of the starting group too, just didn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's uh, it's perplexing to say the least. And we'll see where it all goes. But uh, but Lakers fans, not not thrilled with Darvin Ham right now. And he's definitely under the microscope. So we'll see where all of this goes. Uh, the Lakers right. are an organization that they will move a little quicker than some others on a coach. They, they don't tend to let it linger for years and years crying about, well, we got to pay him and all this other yeah. stuff. They have had a history of, you know, at times that they'll move. I'm, I'm going back quite, quite a ways. Probably a lot sure. of people listening and watching weren't alive, but, but they used to move pretty quick on coaches. So it wouldn't surprise me if they, they, if it really goes south that they don't make a move at the end of the year. Yeah, and if you've listened to some of the players' comments, some of the players are not super on board with what's been going on. So it's it's a situation to keep an eye on, and um, and we'll see how it plays out from here. All right, let's go to, uh, speaking of the Lakers, DeJounte Murray, potentially on the trade market for the Atlanta Hawks. But, Keith, what I'm trying to figure out, because this is what, you know, the, the Lakers got mentioned by Shams Trani as a team that's monitoring DeJounte Murray. Um, of course, we can talk about whether or not it's worth giving up Austin Reeves for. I say no, but... Uh, but there's a lot of that. He's a very, very good player, though, and he could be an interesting fit with a lot of teams. What do the Hawks want, though? What is it that they're trying to do? Like, what's that's that's one of the kind of unknowns, the mysteries of this whole situation is what is it exactly that the Hawks would be trying to accomplish in a DeJounte Murray trade? Yeah, it's, it's my guess would be let's recoup some of the picks we gave up, right, and get some of those back because that was a you know issue now and is going to continue to be an issue well they have murray uh, out you know on the roster uh his contract goes from 18.2 this year 
because he signed that extension, that jumps up to 25.5 next year and then just climbs from there about $2 million a year. So that starts to become a whole other thing, right? If you're Atlanta, I'd be looking for, give me some draft picks. If I can get a player that can play, great. And then give give me salary relief. Get, get me a little bit out of this because they've got some other stuff going on, right? You've got Clint Capella. They extended a Kongwu. You've got DeAndre Hunter on a... Mm-hmm. a contract. Sadiq Bey is a free agent at the end of the year. Jalen Johnson is very important to them. He just returned to the lineup. He'll be another guy that'll be coming up. And obviously you have Trey Young on the max deal. So, and Bogdanovich too is another guy that they extended. None of their contracts are bad individually. It's just when you pile them all together, this is a wildly expensive team for a team that is just not very good. I mean, they're they're bad. They're they're out of the playing picture right now. They are uh, 11th in the East, and they're 12 and 18. Uh, so it's not that's not good enough for how expensive this team is and other things they have to take care of. So we look at it right now, going into the the summer, they're only about two million ish clear of the uh, well, I guess it's really more like eight million clear of the luxury tax line. You can't get the tax for this team, not not with what they have. Like they're just not good enough. So that's your major, major issue. If you are the um the Hawks, you've got to you know sort through and figure that out somehow because the team's just not good enough for what, what they pay for it. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what DeJounte Murray is is worth on the market. They just gave up what, what was it? It was two firsts and a swap, or was it three firsts yeah. and a swap? Two and a swap, yeah. Two and two and a swap. I mean, that's that's a pretty hefty price to pay for Dejounte Murray. Mm-hmm. Now his contract's not bad. Four years under contract after this year, and and it's at sure. a pretty reasonable number, right? Tops out at about thirty million uh, at 31 the end of and it. A half at the last year, yep. Right, and as the as the the cap's going up, I, I think this is going to be perfectly reasonable. So that's not that's not an issue. Like when we talk about Zach Levine, well, is he going to be worth 50 million at the end of this thing? We're not really sure. DeJounte Murray, you don't have that, that issue, but uh, again, are the Hawks going to be able to, I guess the question is, are they going to be selling here at a loss? Are they going to be able to truly recoup all the value that they gave up in order to get him? And that's where I'm a bit skeptical, especially given that it wasn't that long ago that they traded for him that may not be the best look for the organization. But like you said, maybe they just have enough future stuff to worry about that they're willing to, to move off the, the contract and, and 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 move on there. Yeah, let's correct something too, because it was actually three picks in a swap. Oh, it was uh, three. They gave okay. up a pick that they had from Charlotte. So it was two of their own picks, <clears throat> a swap of their own pick, and then a pick that they owned from Charlotte too. So, so it was a lot. So, yeah, so, I mean, that's three first-rounders eventually should convey. I don't see anybody paying that. Like, I could be wrong, but I I don't think the market is going to yield that in return for the Hawks. And again, they just did that two summers ago. Yeah, here's your challenge, too. In this new world, the teams that, not the teams that, there's obviously more teams that could use him than just the really expensive teams. But the really expensive teams that could use him, they're not in a position to trade away a whole bunch of future picks. And I know people are like, frozen pick, frozen pick. That doesn't start yet. That's a next year thing. But it, so you could do this right now if you really needed to or wanted to. But your challenge is you need those draft picks. We just talked about it with the Suns. They have nothing. So if they can't make this work, you can't get out of it, right? You can't fix it. Uh, with using draft picks to get there. So that becomes a huge, huge issue. Uh, Another team that was mentioned just since we're talking about, we already talked about the Lakers. Mm -hmm. Obviously there is the clutch angle there and people will talk about that. And So it would just be disingenuous not to mention it, even though I think if you watch and listen to the two of us, that's not something we hammer on too much because as Rich Paul would make sure everybody knows, clutch players play all over the league. Yep, um, but, especially in relation to Zach Levine, he made, he made sure, which we'll yes. talk about talk about next. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 Zach will play anywhere. Please yeah, submit your please. offers. Yes, <laughs> anybody. Um, but Dejounte Murray, where that does come in, that he's a clutch client. The Knicks are reportedly interested, but the Knicks and Clutch have not really gotten along uh, since Leon Rose took over. Uh, Ian mm-hmm. Begley had had a lot of reporting on this. He works for Sportsnet New York, and one of the things that he had out there was. 
this is uh it's been very uh frosty between the two there's been a, a belief from the clutch side uh that uh, CAA clients get preferential treatment in New York. It's obviously where Leon Rose came from was CAA. And if those who don't know the name, Leon Rose runs the next front office. Uh, and there's a belief that they, they prefer those guys. And there's some data to probably back that up too. I um, that that's where that's been. Now it is not uncommon for a front office to really work with a particular agent. For example, Boston, Jason Glushon, uh, the agent, they have like five of his guys under contract. They've had like six or seven over the last few years. It's you find a good working relationship and you just yep. keep going back to it. It's why but, you see teams continue to trade with the same teams. <clears throat> exactly. Yep. So then when you get into this position with these guys, this turns into a little bit of, all right, is that really a thing? And you know, you probably have a little bit more work to do if you're the next, if you wanted DeJounte Murray. My question is, what God, you don't need another why? card. Like, yeah, that, I was going to say the same know, thing. Should yeah. they want DeJounte Murray? I don't want anything that takes Jalen Brunson into more of a off-ball role. He's so mm -hmm. good. Like, don't do not do anything that's going to you know change that up. But, yeah, I mean, a lot of teams should be in on DeJounte Murray. Don't you know, mistake us for this. There's a lot of teams that should be all over him. It's just going to be, can the Hawks find a deal that makes sense for them now? Or is this going to have to be something that drags into the summertime when it's a yeah. little easier because of multiple roster spots and all that other stuff to make uh, these bigger trades? Yeah, the the Knicks, I don't, I, like we're seeing it right now, right? We're seeing that with the Hawks, this whole idea of we're going to put Trey Young and DeJounte Murray together in the same backcourt, it's not working out the way they want it to. If you're the Knicks, why are you looking at that and saying, oh, Sign me up for that. Yes, that thing that's not working in Atlanta. Let's do the same thing here, and let's yeah, put exactly. it with with Jalen Brunson. Now, Jalen Brunson and Trey Young are not the same player, but still, just conceptually, it's a it's a similar idea here. Doesn't make a lot of sense. If you want to go add another guard, and you're the Knicks, aim lower. Go get somebody that that is fine just coming off the bench and being a backup if need be. Or if you find a matchup that works, you can also slide that player in and and have him play alongside Brunson. But to me, you're you're shooting a tier or two too high if you're the Knicks and you're going after DeJounte Murray because you're paying him enough to where if it's not really working with Jalen Brunson, kind of like how it's not really working in, in Atlanta, then you you kind of need to make a move. And it's hard to do that with a guy that's making, you know, well, he's making 18 million this year, but it's going to be making a, a lot of money into the future. Yeah, 20. Yeah, roughly. What does that work out to about 27 million a year? Mm -hmm. Average annual value. Average. So, yeah, that, that gets a little, little trickier. But yeah, it's yeah, I don't get it. Like I would probably go a different direction if it were me, but it's it's not my team. So all right, figure it out, I guess. So I just don't see where, where that one comes together. All right, let's jump over to Zach Levine and his market update. I wish I had a cricket sound effect right now. Um, yeah. I should I should have or like preloaded like wind that. whistling across the plane, like, <laughs> you know, something like that, like you know, tumbleweeds. Because Woj today on Threads, and again, I'm gonna pump. I put this on uh, X, Twitter, whatever we're calling it uh, today. If you're not following Woj on Threads, you're missing stuff because he is putting little stuff out there. And every week he does a uh, Q and A. And one of the questions was, "What's going on with Zach Levine?" And he said, "The Zach Levine trade market is barren." Yeah, uh, so that's uh that, that, that's not good. Um, uh, I'm thinking like Siberia, like uh, you know, Antarctica, um, the frozen wasteland yeah, that is yeah. the Zach Levine yeah. trade market. You know, mean, right? In Star Wars, like I'm just looking out. There's <laughs> there you go. A whole lot of nothing. Here's the here's the thing. Uh, is that while we're as we get closer to February eighth, the more of a problem this becomes if the market yeah. is is indeed barren, right? If it, this was a few weeks ago when we first started hearing this, that there is no yeah. trade market. Okay, it's mid-December though. Like Danny Ainge wants five picks for Lowry market. And like, you know, I mean, the trade market isn't super developed and people who who are kind of out on the market are asking for a fortune or offering nothing depending on whether you're on the buyer or seller side. So, okay, maybe there's not a, a real buyer out there. But again, the closer and closer we get to that February trade deadline, the more trade rumors are going to come out. That's why now we're hearing this DeJounte Murray stuff and all these other little you know names are popping up. The more real talks get, the longer this goes with the wind whistling through the trees here on the, the Zach Levine trade market, um, the, the worse it is for, for Chicago, especially since you know the Bulls just beat the Hawks. They've been 
been playing much better. I, If I'm the Bulls, I'm not that pumped about bringing back Zach Levine. I know they need to prove he's healthy, but they've been much better without him, which doesn't help his trade value either. So this is going to be a situation to monitor. The longer this goes on, the more difficult it's going to be for the Bulls to get a, a good deal and not a deal where they just have to say, hey, somebody take this salary and we're going to wash our hands of this. Yeah, it's exactly it. It gets very complicated to pull off a deal because of where his salary is. The years left on his contract. They they need some team that is just 100% convinced Zach Levine's our guy. He's going to fix all of our problems. Mm -hmm. He's going to lift us. We don't care about the long-term money. But that team's just not out there, right? Everybody wants to keep saying the Lakers, but you know, if the Lakers wanted him, it, it's not that it would be done because the Lakers still have, we've got about two and a half ish, three weeks yep. before they can trade a couple guys who might need to be involved in a big trade like this. But we know it's probably close to done. And it'd be one of those, like, we're just waiting for those yeah. guys to become trade eligible. That doesn't seem to be out there unless everybody's doing a really good job of keeping it quiet. We all know how that goes. So I, I, I don't know, man, I look around, I, this is a big chunk of what I do. Constantly, I'm looking at like, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. I, I've heard some people say, like, could the Pistons or the Hornets, who are bad, try yeah. to get in and get him just for salary matching and say, hey, we're getting him, and then hopefully he can help kind of lift us as we move forward. But for now, it's it, it, that if you're the Bulls, you're hoping maybe something like that emerges. And if you're Zach Levine, you're hoping then that maybe that kind of kicks the Lakers into gear to say, Hey, no, wait a minute. Like we, we don't want you to get sent there. Like, let's try to figure right. that out. So yeah, right now, a whole, whole lot of nothing. Yeah. So that, that's the situation on, on the Zach Levine front for right now. We'll see Can how it goes. The the yeah. Uh, let's do it. Vucevic going to be out seven to 10 days. He's got an injury, a groin injury. I uh, did not play. The bulls are extremely small uh, without him. Andre Drummond is the only other five on the roster. They're next. Maybe bulls. he's all they need. Yeah, he was great last night. Oh, oh my God. gosh. Yeah. You, 25 yeah. and 24, I think, was right. his final yeah, line. Something like Points that. and rebounds. And it was at least 20 20. And then yeah. he just kind of kept going from there. And he played great. Like, yeah. this was not just he just kind of stumbled it. Like, he was like getting after it on both ends of the floor, like really attacking the glass. There were a lot of jokes out there. Of, Did somebody promise him the Lakers starting job? Like, what's going on here <laughs> with this? Which was, you know, that was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, he looked really, really good. The problem is the only other guy that approaches anything of size is Adama Sanogo, who's a two-way player um, it, that hasn't had any NBA experience. So they're, they, they muddled through the minutes when Drummond sat. They, Kind of went to Terry Taylor for a little bit as some minutes. Terry Taylor is like six foot four, power forward. He has one of the weirdest games like in the NBA, um, but he's not a real answer. So we'll see if this thing stretches out and the Bulls keep playing better. It's rarely, this is just a good opportunity to say, it's really about the backup. It's what happens behind the backup, right? You yeah. Most teams have a backup who can step in and play minutes for somebody. It's what happens behind them where it gets real messy. Yeah, and so that's going to be something to keep an eye on. Again, fortunately, it sounds like this is more of a short-term injury for Vucevic, so this is just kind of a, you know, put a Band-Aid on it for a little bit, and then and then you should be okay. Just got to kind of get through this this time period. Again, if Andre Drummond continues to play like this, then the Bulls will be just fine, although we're certainly not expecting that out of him on a night-in, night-out basis, basis, but he certainly did step up in his first opportunity to do so. Uh, let's jump over to, we've talked about them a little bit, but the Pistons, uh, they're looking at acquiring forwards. Again, as they we, set the record for as those, they set the record for losses, season. they have not won since October. Yeah, we're it's almost January. They haven't won since October. They yeah. get your Celtics next. Um, I saw John Hollinger put out there that the Raptors are are something to the fact i'm paraphrasing but something to the fact that the raptors are already palpably nervous about their game because nobody wants to be the team to to break the streak nobody yeah. wants to be the team to lose to the pistons so the celtics aren't looked at as a team that's actually going to lose to them and then the raptors are up next maybe there's a chance the pistons could win that one i thought they might beat the nets the other night that didn't happen uh, i guess that was last night that didn't happen the nets turned it on down the stretch and won so you've got this team that hasn't 
it, it's going to be almost two months now since they've won a basketball game. Why on earth are they looking to be buyers on the market for guys like OG Adenobi or Pascal Siakam? I mean, if you're Pascal Siakam and you get traded to Detroit, like obviously the Raptors haven't been great. Same thing with OG though, but you can't be super excited, excited about it if that's where you wind up. No, you're absolutely right. It, it, I don't get it. Like I would kind of understand it if it was one of these where, all right, this guy has three years left on his contract. Yeah. Not good money. You're going to give us a first round pick or two in addition. Guy's not terrible, but he's just not great. We'll take him in. Kind of what Tobias Harris was like two years ago. Yeah. Like if this was two years ago, I would understand the Pistons maybe being in on it because all right, we're going to give up our cap space next summer, but that's fine because we got paid in, in a good draft picks or whatever it is. And, off we go. But as it stands today, this seems like a, we got to do anything to snap this losing streak situation here. And it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, OG and Anobi is young, but I don't know that OG and Anobi is like jumping for joy to re-sign in Detroit. Mm -mm. Like he's going to have options as a free agent. I don't know that Miles Bridges is another guy that was mentioned. I'm not sure that's where I would really want to go for any number of reasons. But one of the big ones is another free agent. All of these guys are free agents. It was Siakam, Ananobi, Tobias Harris, and uh, Miles Bridges. So, Would any of them stay? Yeah, that's the question, right? And clearly, if you're Detroit, you can't be talking about, hey, we're going to give up you know, multiple young, good young players and draft picks. It's going to have to be things like Bogdanovich and Burks or yeah. you know, a lesser trade package to try to get guys like that. And then you start looking at it. Philadelphia is a different situation because they're good. Right. So I'm sure if they could move Tobias Harris for a move that really strengthens their rotation going forward, that would make sense. But if I'm the Raptors, I don't know that I really want those guys. Like that doesn't make a lot of sense for me. And there's no cap relief achieved because they're Siakam in and Nobi are going to be free agents anyway. So just gets it's very weird. This is why, and I and I wrote about this today. If you're the Pistons, if you're thinking I don't know that Weaver's our guy. You got to fire him before the trade deadline. You cannot let him make moves now that could really set you back. And I got to make all the jokes you want. It could get worse. Like this could be something where now all of a sudden it's, hey, we traded draft capital and young players. And now our future is really a mess going yeah. forward. I, I, it's not going to get worse than 27 straight losses. I get that part of it. But you, this season's over and done with. That's written off beyond – it should be solely about player development now forward. So that part doesn't matter, but you cannot be giving up good stuff to try and fix any of this right now. That's just a huge mistake. Yeah, you're you're now at rock bottom. You're going to be a tough sell to free agents this summer. This is going to be multiple years to erase the stink of this season. That's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be the team that's a little bit better than anybody expected next year. You're going to have to build upon that the year after that. Then you're going to start to get the attention of free agents again. You go trade for a guy that's going to be a free agent. They're just going to bolt for the nearest opportunity that can give them a chance to win because you're not ready for this right now if you're the Pistons. Now is the time, as you said, to just focus on young players. If it's a, hey, we've got to absorb whoever, a veteran X, and we're just going to buy them out before or after the trade deadline or, or something like that. And we're going to pick up some draft capital. Sure. Go, go for that. Right. Do, do that. Um, or we're going to trade away a Bogdanovich. We're going to trade away some of these other veteran guys that, that we've got. Sure. But adding in guys who are about to be free agents and are certainly going to be flight risks. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And like you said, if you're making that kind of move just to ease some of the pain of this season of, Hey, we might pick up a couple more wins over the course of the season. Big picture, that does not help you get to where you want to go. So if those that look, if you're Pistons ownership, you got to be really careful with, with what they do here. It's terrible right now. It's it's frustrating. Fans are are not having it, obviously. Uh, they're getting the sell the team chance and, and all that kind of stuff. But you can't do anything foolish just to win a few meaningless games right now. Because like you said, the games this season no longer matter outside of developing your future. Yep. Yeah, you you blow this, those uh sell the team chants are only gonna get louder and more more common 
place. There, there'll, yeah. there'll be a nightly thing very loudly and they'll start happening, you know, much earlier than the last couple minutes of games and everything else. So yeah, it's just all, all bad stuff right now for the Pistons. But like I said, I wrote a long piece about it over at spot track. If mm-hmm. you want to check that out. Speaking of selling the team, the Mavs sale yeah. is, is done. Mark Cuban still retains uh, control of, of basketball operations. So he's going to be um, still making the decisions, but he's sold uh, a big stake in, in the Mavs. And, you know, th- this is interesting because we don't typically, typically if somebody buys, is if somebody does spend the kind of money it takes to get a team, part of it is they want to have the shiny new toy. They want to mm-hmm. be able to play with it. In this case, the Mavs are basically just an investment. And it's a little bit different than the way we typically see team sales go. Yeah, it's probably been a while since Mark Cuban's had to go ask anybody's permission for anything, right? Like yeah. that that's been been weird. And that's how this is gonna work, I imagine, where yeah, he has control of basketball ops. So that means they can probably negotiate trades and get to him. But then does he have to still go and say, Hey, we want to add ten million dollars to the payroll, which is Twenty million dollars in tax penalties and whatever else it may be, uh, I don't know. We don't know how that's going to work out, but uh, the valuation comes in at roughly four billion dollars uh, with with everything. So that's you know good news. Uh, all all the right things are said in press releases and everything as far as you know we're we're looking forward to building the team the right way and all this and that. There was some very kind of to me reckless speculation uh, early Not that like, did they move the team. That was yeah. you know very much no that's not a thing they're going to build a whole new arena and entertainment district somewhere in the dallas area um i know there's a lot of uh, griping and grumbling going on about that because apparently it's not going to be downtown it's going to be a little bit further out but i I don't really know the the you know ins and outs of all that so so yeah it everything just going to move forward it's going to be a little probably weird and my my thing i still wonder is how long does it last like, is there a point mm-hmm. where, yeah, this is as far as we're going to go with this. We're going to look at something different down the line, or does this stay in a, uh, all right, no, yeah, we're, this is how the, the the trades and approvals and basketball ops and all that stuff is just going to be Mark Cuban for however long he wants to do it, or is this just a transitional thing? Right, right. All right, let's jump over to uh, your Celtics. Keeping an eye on Kelly Olenek, another player to watch on the trade market. Would make a lot of sense for the Jazz to move on from him. Jordan Clarkson, another Jazz player to watch. And then, of course, you know, Lowry Markkinen. We'll see if they move him. John um, John, yeah, oh, yeah. How do I how do I leave him? He is like know, a, man. he is our show's mascot at, the, at this yeah. point. We we just need to whenever do he's the, done playing, we're just gonna get a third box and he's just gonna join us. Uh, that's it each day, just hang out. And, you know, be, be a part of it for real. <laughs> the NBA John Collins podcast. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's that's what this is. Um, but Kelly Olenek, interesting talk. I mean, former Celtic would be would be coming back, uh, gives you some bench depth, gives you another guy who can shoot, which is certainly something that that, uh, uh, that Boston's going to prioritize. So it makes sense as a as a target, somebody that can come in and just and give you some minutes in the right situations and give you a little bit more depth. I guess the question becomes, what is it that uh, the Jazz would want in return? But the salary is small enough to where it's, you know, it, it wouldn't be super difficult to to find a path to getting something done. It's not the salary. That's definitely true. It's just a little too large for the Celtics to do it easily. They mm-hmm. would have to part with either a rotation player or pile together all of their minimum contracts. And then that gets real messy because I'm not sure the jazz want to bring in five guys for one and cut, you know, four guys or anything right. like that. So that gets super complicated there. You may need to expand it, involve other teams and all that sort of stuff. Uh, if it was going to go that way, I think the bigger issue is for Boston, really any contender, if they're hoping for, hey, we're going to register interest. And then if he gets bought out, we'll go after him. They can because the salary is just under the non-taxpayer MLE. And remember, apron teams, can't sign anybody who makes more than the non-taxpayer MLE mm-hmm. in buyout season. They're not allowed. So Bolinick's just under that. But the problem is the Jazz will find a trade uh, yeah. for him. He should very easily uh, be very easily tradable if they need to. So that it should not get to a buyout situation. Also, the Jazz, I'm not saying they're changing their mind on anything. Starting to play a little bit better now that they're healthy again, too. They've won three in a row. I don't think that's going to have them thinking – 
hey, let's chase the playing tournament, but right. let's see what it looks like in two weeks. Maybe they are playing enough better that, hey, we're kind of in this thing now. We're not that far off these other teams, and maybe they hang around kind of like they did last year. So that could be a thing. But I, I don't know that I would put a lot of stock in Boston getting Kelly Olenek because I just don't think they're going to trade a current rotation player to make it happen, and that's where it kind of all falls apart. Yeah, I mean, I think he's definitely a guy to to keep an eye on on the trade market in general. I could, I, I could definitely see him getting uh, getting moved before then. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you bring up some good points about why Boston may not be the landing spot. If he does wind up getting bought out, I, I would bet that's probably where he goes. But like you said, I think the Jazz can find something rather than just just buy him out. I would hope Oklahoma City could beat it just by here's a couple picks and the matching salary and let's yeah. go. Um, with that, uh, Davis Bertans maybe is the guy that could get traded there if they want it or something like that. All right. Uh, Draymond Green now expected to miss somewhere between 11 and 13 games in total as he's still going through things with the league and checking off all the boxes in terms of what they want to see in order for him to return to play. Uh, the Warriors could certainly use him back in action, but uh, this is going to be now Draymond Green is really going to have to be on his best behavior because I think the next, if there's anything that happens after this, that's that's probably it for him on, on the season. So um, again, 11 to 13 games missed for Draymond. That's a pretty good chunk of the season. I was guessing 10 would be the suspension when when the uh, it, it, the altercation happened. But yeah, now it's uh, now everybody's going to be all eyes on Draymond just waiting for the next for the next shoe to drop. And when it does, that could be that could be really catastrophic. Yeah, eleven to thirteen games. That's three to four weeks total. He already missed five, so he is now. If he does miss the thirteen, that would also take him out of awards conversation because mm-hmm. um, he would be under the threshold for games played for most of the awards. So that's another piece. Not that Draymond's going to win MVP or make All NBA, but All Defense is certainly in the realm for him as it always is. But yeah, I I think. Two things I'm watching here. One is I thought it was interesting that Woj uh, in his reporting, this was kind of the Christmas day, Christmas morning, our reporting Mm -hmm. that came out was he's eligible to practice and be with the team. He just can't be at games with them, but he's not, he's staying away because he's really trying to work through this stuff. So that's, that's interesting to, you know, some extent there. And then I think the other piece is when he does come back, guys are going to go at him. They're going to try to agitate him and get him to do something silly. And that's going to be the real measure of, is he, you know, is he, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but can can he avoid it? Right. Can can he make sure he doesn't react to the stuff people are trying to get him to do? And that's going to be something that's going to be, we'll be watching obviously right from his first game all the way through. Yeah. Yep. Well, hopefully he's able to do it because he's a, he's still a very good player. You want to see this Warriors team go out the right way. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a little bit till they see Draymond again. And then when he gets back, all eyes are going to be on him. Uh, another veteran that uh, that is in the news, PJ Tucker, uh, the Bucks and Heat potentially have interest in him. I uh, think that he can still be a piece for either one of those teams. So uh, another guy to keep an eye on. Could this be a buyout situation or do you think this goes down as a, as a trade uh, deal? I think for either of these teams, it would probably have to be. They just don't really have the salary to just kind of throw to the Clippers to, to right. make a trade. Mark Stein was the one who had this, and he did note in that that, yeah, this is a, uh, you know, probably more if he gets set free via buyout. I think yeah. if you're the Clippers, what you're probably going to look to do is, is there something we can flip P.J. Tucker in his $11 million contract in another deal to fill a hole somewhere if we feel like we need to? Can we do that? Barring that, then do the Heat start to say, hey, let's talk about how much can we lower, not so much this year, or not the Heat, the Clippers rather. Do the Clippers talk to him and say, how much can we not so much lower this year's contract, but what about next year's $11.5 million player option? Can we lower it there? Because otherwise, if you're the Clippers, you might rather have them on the roster as a trade candidate for next season sure at that 11 and a half million so a lot of ways this could play out it's clear he's not going to play for the clippers uh there's just no rotation spot for him there so this is just going to be some that again probably takes us all the way to february 8th and maybe slightly beyond if there's a buyout situation but at 11 million just like kelly olenek 
He's a low enough salary. He could join any team in the league that he would want to if he did take the buyout. Right. Which is, you know, this is all interesting because he's a guy that when that trade first went down and everybody went, whoa, they got they got hard. Oh, my gosh. They got P.J. Tucker thrown in, too. Right. Like that was that was a thing. But now he's not even part of the rotation for them again. He's getting up there in years. He's 38. So we'll see how much, you know, how much longevity he's got left in the NBA. But uh, I, I think this is probably going to wind up needing to be that that buyout situation that you talked about in order for him to land with one of these teams. Maybe he winds up being the veteran guy that you know a team wants to give a shot to, especially places where he've had success in the past. But with, I don't think that I think the name value he developed a reputation among NBA fans. I think the name value is greater than what he's going to actually provide. I don't think he's swinging anything for a team, swinging a series or anything like that anymore. More name than game. More, there you go. That's what I need to land on. More <laughs> name than game. All right. I think we've made it through everything. One more. What do we have? Aaron Gordon. Oh, I missed that one. Oh, yeah, my okay. goodness. And you know what's what's the reminder? You can see it here under my glasses. The dog got me today. Oh, no. Right there. You can see my scar. I'm looking a little bit like uh, Zaymot from G.I. Joe. I don't. Were you a G.I. Joe kid? Kind of. Like, uh, I was... Uh, I, I was... I was G.I. Joe adjacent, essentially. Like, I would pay attention to G.I. Joe stuff. I knew, like, kind of the main characters, you know, mm -hmm. like Snake Eyes, of course, and you know, sure. Storm Shadow and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I was more like Ninja Turtles were everything for me. See, Ninja I Turtles Ninja and He-Man. See, I was not a big He-Man kid. Okay. I, I, yeah, Ninja Turtles I like, But, yeah, I loved G.I. Joe. That was my, like, thing. That was my favorite thing. Outside of, like, wrestling guy, like, I was a big wrestling kid back in the day. Ultimate Warrior. Uh, oh, man, all like, the whole deal. I was, like, I loved it. We went to shows all the time. When we have longer time, we'll do scheduled nonsense. And I'll tell yeah. you, like, my uncle worked for WWF back in the day when it was oh, cool. WWF. So yeah, I can tell you a bunch of stuff about that. But anyway, um, yeah, I was just asking because um, there was the twins that they were Cobra bad guys, Tomax mm -hmm. and Zaymont. And one had like the scar on his face. So I've got the little scar going, but and it happened. I was playing with the dog and yeah, we, as you do sometimes with the dog, we're getting a little too wild up, round up and she jumped up and she caught me uh, with her, with her nails. Aaron Gordon's out for, we don't know how long with some yeah. dog bites. Um, we, we don't know what the situation was and why the dog bit him and what happened, whose dog it was. We don't know any of that stuff, but it uh, sounds like over sometime after they played on Christmas, because he played Christmas Day, uh, he got bit by a dog and uh, face in, in his right shooting hand. So he's uh, going to be out for a while. It's uh, 20 plus stitches that he had Ooh. to have. So we don't know what that'll look like. And he's going to be away from the team while he's out. So wow. potentially, you know, let's see, you know, with Denver, if this turns into a week or two, eh, not that big of a deal, they'll be fine. If it stretches any longer, only silver lining, I guess, if you're the Nuggets is let's really find out uh, what Julian Strother and uh, Peyton Watson and those guys mm -hmm. off the bench can do with 25 minutes a night because they're definitely going to get them now. Have you seen the, uh, I don't even know what like hotel chain it is or the Nikola Jokic and Peyton Watson commercials. Yes, those were great. They were on all day on Christmas. Yeah, those those were, um, I I know this is part of the gag. But Nikola Jokic, he has no comedic timing whatsoever, and that's part of it. Is he's supposed to be stiff and yeah. cardboard and you know all all that kind of I, stuff. But <laughs> but I'm watching that and I'm like, okay, at least they're leaning in. They're leaning into My it. My favorite one was the one where Peyton Watson says to him, um, "Is that an invite to Serbia?" And Jokic oh yeah. Like, no. <laughs> yeah, just shaking his head. Yeah. No, those were good. The uh, Jimmy Butler and uh, Jaime Hawkes one was funny too with the coffees. Um, that, that was funny. It was, I uh, didn't see that you know, one. Yeah. It was like, they, they were, they were looking at coffee. So that was a interesting two side by side comparison. So yeah. So hotels.com did well with, uh, well, that's what it was. Christmas okay. Yeah. Hashtag not a sponsor. Yeah. 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 It, we're open hotels.com. Well, we'll, that's right. You know, please reach out. If you're watching, let, let us know. That's right. Re reach out and, uh, we'd we'll be happy to, you know, test out your, your services and all that and give everybody a nice there little review on them. <laughs> yep, perfect. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining. We're going to head towards New Year's now, but obviously this is the time of year. It's from, from here all the way through the first week of February and all the way through February 8th, really, 
It's only going to pick up. We're going to hear more and more NBA trade news, rumors, all kinds of stuff's going to be coming out. So make sure you guys are subscribing right here to the NBA Front Office Show, both on the YouTube channel and over on the podcast side, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Till next time, everybody. See ya and stay safe.